Hey, I want to uh, encourage you guys that uh, you pray about this and ask God, hey, is the Rock Bible called you want something to me to do? And then I want you to listen for his voice in the whisper that says, yes, okay? Because it's for everybody. All of us need to grow in the things of God. And if you haven't been to the Rock Bible College yet, I want to encourage you to go out there after church today, uh, get a brochure, talk to uh, some of the people that are out there. Uh, you'll see they've got the TRBC shirts or Pastor Teresa Aguilar is right here on the front row. Wave it, everybody, Pastor Teresa. She heads up our Bible College. She's doing a wonderful job and uh, just awesome. And so they can answer any questions that you may have. And don't let, like he said, resource or time hold you back. God will make a way for you to get in there, and you will be blessed and glad that you did. And it will equip you, not just for, you know, some people say, well, I'm not going in the ministry. What do I need Bible calls for? Well, you're already in the ministry. Uh, I wonder, does anybody know that they're a full-time minister of the gospel in this place? Right? So that's for you, right? Because Bible college is going to help you on the job. It's going to help you in the home. It's going to help you in the community. It will make you a better Christian as you get instructed in the word of God. And guess what else? You'll have me. What could be better than that, right? We get to hang out together and, and learn about the blood covenant and explore the things of God together. And so uh, that'll be your first semester, first year students. Uh, you'll, you'll have blood covenant class and uh, so many more classes, so much more that God wants to do in your lives. It's going to be wonderful. Well, I wonder, is there anybody excited about getting into the word of the Lord today? Come on, get your Bibles in hand. Get ready to receive. We're going to pray. Now, uh, before we pray, let me just lay this out. Make sure to tune out distractions. Put your cell phones on silent mode or do not disturb whatever you need to do. For those of you parents that got your kids waving me in the family room, love you guys on the side. Love you guys. Make that about a two-week experience. Then get your children over to the greatest children's ministry on the planet. They're going to love it over there. Speaking of the children's ministry, they are currently coming back from camp this weekend. And so, my goodness, I know they had a wonderful time. It's the first year my baby is driving herself to and from as a junior camp counselor. And so, uh, we've been kind of getting a little inside scoop about what's going on. They're having a great time. And God is doing a wonderful thing in your kids' lives. And so, uh, if you're heading out right afterwards to pick them up, make sure to drive safe. All right, it'll be wonderful. But... uh, Children's ministry is just amazing over there, and so you'll want to get your kids over there, and then finally tune out distractions. No getting up, no walking around during this time. You know, you sit in movies for three hours. Uh, You can sit an hour and a half church service, and some of you guys were late, so it's not even that long, all right? So let's get into the word of the Lord. You're welcome to stand. You're welcome to stay seated. If you don't have the ability to stand, that's okay. Maybe you want to kneel before the Lord, even online. Come on, get your hearts ready to receive. You can stand right where you're at or maybe kneel or sit, but get your heart ready to receive for what God has for you today. Come on, let's pray. Father, we're so grateful as we come into your house, God, that we have the ability to hear your voice and to follow you. God, we're grateful that today we have not come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman, young or old, black, white, brown, tall, short, thin, wide, educated, uneducated. We've come to hear from you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction that we need for our lives where we've gotten off track. God, we'd ask that you get us back on track with you. And today, Lord, we don't just ask this blessing of your presence and your power here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center only. No, no, God, we'd ask it for all of our brothers and sisters here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, we ask that you would bless them if they're preaching your gospel truth, lifting up your name. We ask that uh, you would encourage and strengthen and build your church, God. Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels, Assemblies of God, and Foursquare denominations, the Catholic churches that are lifting up your name, and the Adventist churches, God, preaching your truth, God, the Messianic Jewish congregations, Lord, there are brothers and sisters, and at no time do we see ourselves as any better than anybody else, but God, we humble ourselves, and we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we pray for the persecuted church scattered abroad throughout the nations, Lord. Uh, God, we would ask for their encouragement, for their strength, for their healing, God, their wholeness, God. You would protect them, guard them, guide them, and direct them, Lord. May they endure to the end, to the glory of God. And Father, as it says in your word, we pray in obedience, God, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's in Jesus' mighty name we're all in agreement. We say... Amen, amen. As you're having a seat, get your Bibles and go with me to Mark chapter number two. We're in a series called the Body Life Series, talking about the life of Jesus Christ when he was here on the earth. You know, as you see the life of Jesus and how he lived when he was here, you see your life. Because the Bible tells us that we are the body of Christ. And when you see what Jesus does, how he acted, what he thought, then you can see how you're to live life, how you're to act, how you're to live, and how you're to think. 
And in this, we've seen a, a sub-series that we've been calling Controversy on the Sabbath. This is part number three of Controversy on the Sabbath. Now, we've got a lot of new people in the place today, and that's okay. Today's message will stand on its own. But I would encourage you to go back online and get a hold of those first two messages and catch up with some of the concepts that we're talking about. Mark chapter number two, it's a different story than the one we've been in at the Pool of Bethesda. Now it moves on to another day on the Sabbath day. In Mark two, we're going to read verse number 23 down through verse number 20. Let's read it together. It says this in Mark chapter number 2, verse number 23. It says, Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, we have to stop and pause for a moment and think about what's taking place. It's the Sabbath day. This was the day of rest. They were to do no work on the Sabbath. And so here the disciples and Jesus are walking through grain fields. And as they walk, the disciples are hungry. And so they reach out and they pluck a head of grain. They roll it in their hands. They blow the chaff away. And then they eat the grain that's there. Now, the Bible tells us that that was okay. There was nothing wrong with them when they were walking through someone else's field to pluck a grain and to eat that. God said if you're going through your neighbor's field, it's okay if you want to have a piece of fruit. It's okay if you're hungry and in need, you can grab a... a, handful of the grain and roll it up and then eat the rest that's there. God had no problem with that. He had a problem if you were walking through your neighbor's grain field and you busted out a sickle and you started reaping and then you set up a fruit stand right outside of there and started making money on that. That's called stealing. And God says, no, all right? That's not what he was saying. But he did say, if you're walking through and you want to grab some, that's okay. It's all right to share. It's okay. Don't be so connected to stuff. In fact, they actually commanded them not to reap the edges of their fields, and that was reserved for the poor that was living among them. Isn't God amazing how he has a provision for everyone? I mean, God is so generous and so awesome that he said, hey, leave that alone. Let that be for the stranger and for the foreigner and for those that are poor and in need so that they can come and they can sustain themselves. And so here the disciples are walking through and they're plucking these grains, but the Pharisees had a problem. And they said to Jesus, look, what they're doing is not lawful. In other words, by them grabbing a handful of grain, rubbing it in their hands, blowing away the chaff, they're reaping a harvest. And they shouldn't be doing that work of reaping on the Sabbath. You remember we talked about how they had something called the Mishnah. It was the commentaries of the rabbis that they wrote about the law of Moses. And they had different categories that they categorized, major categories of work. Reaping was one of those categories. And within those categories, they had subcategories of things like, you know, putting in the sickle and that sort of thing. Obviously, that was harvesting. One of them was plucking. They said that plucking is actually reaping. And so they would actually hide mirrors uh, before the Sabbath day on the day of preparation. That was Friday night. They would hide mirrors because just in case somebody walked by the mirror, was like, ooh, I got a little gray hair there. And they plucked that out. Oh, no, you've started to work on the Sabbath day. I mean, ladies, can you imagine you would not be able to carry the burden of your false eyelashes or your hair extensions? And I'm going to church on Sunday, Pastor. But really, that's what they're talking about. It was, it was absurd to our thinking to think that this is work, and yet when Jesus is confronted with this, he doesn't argue over the lawfulness of the disciples' actions. He doesn't take them to Deuteronomy chapter 23 where it talks about that. He doesn't even go to those things. He goes to a different scripture, and look at what it says. It says in verse number 25, but he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abithar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. Verse 27, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Verse 28, therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus quotes from 1 Samuel, and he talks about a story where David was running from King Saul. And as he ran, he fled. And he wasn't prepared to be traveling. And so he didn't have any food. He didn't have any provisions. He didn't even have a sword with him. So he goes to the house of God, to the tabernacle at the time. And the priest that was there, he runs in and the priest trembles. Why are you here? You shouldn't be here. And David says, I'm I'm on urgent business from the king. And he conceals the matter of the real reason why he's there. And he says, do you have any bread? Because I left in haste. And the priest says, no, I I, I don't have any regular bread. I've got the holy bread that's placed before the Lord. Now, in the law, 
in, in the Levitical law, it said that they would take this bread and they would present it before the Lord, and they had 12 loaves repre- representing the body of Israel. Those 12 loaves represented each one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they would place that before the Lord fresh every day. And so he says, I don't have any regular bread. I've got the holy bread, but that's, you know, reserved for the priest. Only the priest were to eat that bread. And David says, hey, give it to me. I need bread. And so the priest gives David the bread. Now, we would have said, well, that's okay. It's David. This is a man after God's own heart. I mean, think about it. He was the king. Not at this time he wasn't. Oh, well, he was going to become the king, the greatest king that Israel ever knew. Obviously, God would have been okay because it's David. But then Jesus goes on to point out that it wasn't just David. He also gave to the men that were with him. They weren't the king. They weren't called men after God's own heart. They, they weren't people who God approved of in the way that he did of David. And so we find that Jesus points out, hey, listen, I, I don't want to point out how lawful it is. Let me point out a direct violation of God's law and show you that God was all right with that. Because if you're going to jam up these guys about this, what do you have to say about David and his men? And they couldn't say anything. Points out that because it supplied the need for those who are in need. See, God elevates the needs of man above the regulations and the rules provided for in the law. And he points out to them that they're missing the point. That even though they'd read the scripture, because Jesus says, have you never read it? Of course they've read. They're Pharisees. They knew these scriptures. They could debate with you on them. They knew them inside and out. They could quote them. They, they could go to them and, and tell you the stories around these stories. And so what Jesus is saying is, I know you've read them, but you haven't found out the heartbeat of God behind them. And for all of us, we need to make sure that we don't miss the truth of God's word. As we read through the scriptures, as we read through the stories, it's easy to get information. It's easy to say, oh, I understand. Jesus did this. Jesus healed that person. Jesus went there. Jesus went to the cross. And we can miss the implications and the heartbeat and the character and the nature and the attributes of God that are behind the stories. Jesus is saying, don't miss it. There's something greater, something deeper. Because they were missing the point. See, David was hungry. He was in need. And so the priest helped him with what was available. And what was available was bread that was meant for the priests. Now notice, you never find God dealing with David on eating the bread. You find God dealing with David on things like adultery. You find God dealing with David on things like murder. You find God dealing with David on things like numbering the children of Israel who were meant for war because that was something that the other kings and other nations did because it built up their ego and their pride. God deals with David on that. God even dealt with David when he cut the corner of the hem of Saul's garment. Why? Because his heart pained him. And and the Bible, you know, some of the, the old King James, some of you guys got the old King James in your lab and it says his heart smote him. You know, when your heart smotes you, you know what it's doing? It's telling you that's wrong. Don't do that. See, God gave us a conscience, and his Holy Spirit speaks to us through his conscience. And so here, David's conscience, the Holy Spirit, is jamming him up. Hey, you're being disrespectful to authority, David. Stop it. God dealt with him on that. But you never find David's heart smoting him, you ate the priest's bread. God never deals with that. There's no punishment. There's no uh, reaction from God on David eating the bread. God is silent on it. You know what God is saying? He's saying it's all right. It's just bread. There was a human need. David was in his need. Companions were in need. And therefore, there was a provision that I have made. And therefore, it's available to them. See, that means that God is okay. Because God elevates people above policy. Above program. Above procedures. You know, here at the church, we have policy. We have programs. We have procedures. We have all those things, but we never elevate those things above human needs. There have been times where people have told me, yeah, we turned them away. I said, why did you turn them away? Because of our policy. What's our, what's our policy? Say? Well, our policy says this, and they need that. Go call them back and tell them we're so sorry. No, we're going to do that because your needs are greater than our policies in this matter. We elevate the people above the policy, the procedure, and the program. Because without that, we miss the point of what God is doing on the earth. You know, God's about people. Jesus died for people. 
The devil's after people. Angels are looking to long into the things of salvation of people. It's all about people. God's focus is people on the earth. He created us to love us and to be with us. William Barclay writes this. He says, it's possible to read the scriptures meticulously, to know the Bible inside out from cover to cover and be able to quote it verbatim and to pass any examination on it and yet completely miss its real meaning. You know, in Matthew's gospel, they have this same account of this same story. It's a parallel passage, almost word for word. But in Matthew's account, he adds something else. Jesus, after he talked to him about David, starts to talk to him about the temple. He says, and don't you remember that the priests on the Sabbath day are doing work for the temple on the Sabbath? But they're violating the Sabbath for the temple because it's okay. It's the temple. We need to work for God on that day. We have to make these sacrifices on that day. We have to do our duty on that day. It's for God, so it's okay. And Jesus says, if that's okay for them, now one here who's greater than the temple... stands among you but then he goes on in the next verse because they're missing the point and he says this in Matthew chapter 12 verse number 7 but if you had known what this means I desire mercy and not sacrifice you would not have condemned the guiltless notice he exonerates his disciples he says they're guiltless they didn't do anything wrong But you missed the point of the scripture because he quotes from Hosea, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What is that saying? I want loyal covenant love above the policy and the procedure and the program. Is anybody listening today? God is not elevating those things above our human need. He's elevating his love for us, his covenant. See, it's amazing to me because we've had people leave our church over things like the fact that they played rap music in the sanctuary. Christian rap, by the way. On a Sunday night, we were trying to reach a younger generation, younger crowd, and so we said, hey, let's mix up the service. Let's do something different. Let's have, you know, some some cool music playing when they come in and some different graphics on the screen, and we'll have, uh, you know, some different preaching, that sort of a thing. And so one night, the sound team, they chose a song. It was a very popular Christian rap artist, and they played the song, and he was telling his testimony. Someone came inside the sanctuary, and they heard... And they stopped. And they went, I can't believe that they're playing rap music in a Christian church. How dare they? And they stormed over to the sound department and they said, What are you playing on the overheads? What are you playing on the loudspeakers? And they were like, Oh, it's rap. Yeah, it's this Christian artist, isn't it great? And they were like, no, it's not great. Turn that off right now. And they're like, no, we, we were told to play this. Oh, the leadership told you? That shit, I'm out. And they whipped out of this church and left the church. Never talked to the pastors, by the way. Never said, hey, we have a problem with this. Never reached out and said, hey, we disagree. We don't think that you should be doing that. Never gave us an opportunity to talk to them about our purpose. See, they missed the point. They missed the point. Start posting on Google reviews about our church. Yeah, I used to go there, but then they were playing this rap music, and I just don't think that's right. They shouldn't be doing that. That's unholy. I'm sorry. You're going to post that on Google reviews and not come and talk to us about it in person? I better stop before I sin. But, you know, other people have come to this church, and they've gotten all upset because we had Christmas trees in the sanctuary. Some people have, have uh, you know, had things to say about us on social media because we had a trunk or treat. Uh, you know, if you have a better way to reach 10,000 people from our community on a night when the devil's exalting himself, you just let me know about that, and we'll do that. But until then, I'm going to shine a light on a dark night. I'm going to reach people for Jesus all day long. I'm going to use the bait that works to hook the fish, to bring them in. And he who wins souls is wise. It's not about the policy. It's not about the procedure. It's not about the program. It's about God reaching out and meeting the needs of people. Because God loves people. Sorry, I got a little excited on that one. But what does it mean to you? See, when you're reading the Bible, make sure to sit down and say, God, I want to see your heart. Not just get the information. God, give me revelation. 
Give me insight. God, as I read the pages of the Bible, I don't want to just see in black and white letters. God, I want to see your face. I want to see what makes you smile. What makes you happy, God? What do you delight in? What pleases you, God? I want to see what angers you, God. What don't you like? Because, God, I want to stay away from that. And I don't want to like that. God, do I not hate that which you hate and love that which you love. God, what breaks your heart? What do you weep over, God? What makes you sad and what makes you cry? God, what moves you, God? Because I want to know what moves you on the earth and so that, God, I can have that in my life because I need you to move in my life. And don't miss the point. God desires mercy, loyal covenant, love. Sometimes people think, man, you know, if they're not doing it the way we do it, then they got to get out. I was in a church one time. A young man came to the church with a baseball cap on, and one of the ushers took his hand and just flipped the hat off his head and said, hey, son, we respect God in this place. You don't wear a hat inside in church. The young man picked up his hat, threw it back on his head, turned around, and walked out of that church. All because of a scripture that says that men should not have their heads covered when they pray. Uh, you know, if we're going to take that literally, when you pray, take off your ball caps, gentlemen. That's all about it. But right afterwards, you're welcome to throw it right back on. That's okay. Let's not get so legalistic that we miss the heartbeat of God. Let's not, let's not be so stringent and religious that we miss out on the very character, nature, and attributes of God. Because we see in this story that we can miss the point if we're not careful. But the things that God gives us, the gifts of God are given for a purpose. God's gifts are given for a purpose. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This gift that God gave us was given for a purpose. Did you guys hear the one about the priest and the pastor and the rabbi? You didn't hear that one, huh? All right, I'll tell you about that one. Priest, a pastor, and a rabbi sit on a bench talking about their ministries. As they're talking, they get on the subject of miracles. The priest says, oh, I believe in miracles. At our church, one night it was storming like crazy. There's a lightning storm. Our church is made of wood all over. One of those lightning bolts would have hit us. The whole place would have lit up on fire. We'd have lost everything. So we gathered together in the sanctuary and we prayed. And it was amazing. God did a miracle for 100 yards around the church. Not a single bolt of lightning struck that whole night pastor said we had a very similar experience one night we were there at our church worshiping God in the sanctuary and we got news that there was a tornado coming right at the church and so we prayed and for a hundred yards around the sanctuary that tornado went up into the clouds went over and a hundred yards went on the other side and kept going didn't touch the church at all the rabbi said oh my goodness you guys that's nothing I've got a story for you one day on the sabbath we were there in the synagogue and a man came into the synagogue with a case full of money. And he donated it to the synagogue. And we asked him, how much money's in here? And he said, I don't know. It's a lot of money, though. You guys should count it. But we were forbidden to count on the Sabbath day. We didn't know what to do, so we prayed. And a hundred yards around the synagogue, it was a Wednesday. Okay, you guys are like the Sabbath service. First service thought that was a whole lot funnier. For those of you that don't get it, just wait till Wednesday, all right? But listen, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of man. We, we get tired. We need a break. We need to get rest and refreshment from the Lord. You know, the principle, even though it's a spiritual principle, is still a good idea for us in the natural. You need to take a break. You don't need to be working seven days a week. You need to stop and rest and refresh and get into the presence of God and worship the Lord and remember what God has done in your life. And as you do, you're refreshed physically mentally and spiritually, the whole man gets refreshed. It's a principle of God. You know, this works in every area of our life. We don't need to miss the points. We need to realize that God's gifts are given for a purpose. And, and I want to apply this from some scriptures in 1 Timothy. Turn there with me in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. I'm going to read this to you from the New Living Translation. But, but you can read along whatever translation that you have with you today, or if you've even got the app, you can thumb over to the NLT. But in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, the Apostle Paul is giving instructions for conduct in the church. He's giving instructions for Timothy, who's the pastor of that church. Hey, make sure that they don't miss the point. 
and he starts to give some instructions to people about their wealth, okay? Now remember, we're talking about God gives us gifts for a purpose, and in these scriptures, we actually see the purpose of wealth. Let's read it together in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 17 through verse number 19. Again, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. It says this in verse number 17. It says, teach those who are rich in this world. Notice that according to the world's standards, they would have wealth. They are rich in this world. And he says, teach them not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Anybody looked at your bank account lady and, and realized, man, money is so unreliable. I thought I just got paid. It's already gone, right? The Bible says it grows wings and it flies away. Maybe you've been looking at your 401k and the, the flight was down instead of up and you're going, what's going on here? But he says not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God. And then he does a little word play and he says this, who richly gives us all we need for our what? Oh, come on and help me out and read that last word. For our what? Enjoyment. Did you know God wants you to enjoy your life? I mean, sometimes I think Christians get this picture of God that he's this angry old man waiting with a two-by-four to whack us over the head. And if we start to have any fun, he starts frowning at us and looking at us, waiting to zap us with a lightning bolt. But that's not the God of the Bible. God has no problem with you having wealth. He has a problem when wealth has you. Okay, you need some scripture on that? Well, just take a look at Abraham in the book of Genesis. The Bible says that Abraham had 319 servants born in his own house. That's a whole lot of people, right? What are those guys all doing? They're serving Abraham. That means that Abraham is providing their wages. I think Abraham had wealth. In fact, Abraham and Lot couldn't even stay on the same plot of ground because they had so much livestock and so many people and so much stuff that the land couldn't sustain them. They had to split up. You know what that means by the world standards? Abraham was filthy, stinking rich. Okay, how about Solomon? Oh, but Solomon was a king. Yeah, Solomon was a king. And in Solomon's day, Solomon had the wisdom of God on him so much that money didn't matter to him. In fact, it said that silver was like gravel. They just had it out there in the streets and people would be like, oh, silver? Nah, I'm not even going to bend down to pick it up. It was like pennies, you know what I mean? Oh, that's dirty. I'm not going to touch it. Oh, okay, okay, let's try this one. Jesus. Oh, but Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. No, he didn't. But did you know Jesus had a treasure? His name was Judas. He was skimming off the top, and yet they still sustained not just 12. Don't think for a moment it was just 12. The Bible talks about 70 that were his disciples that went out. It talks about thousands that were around Jesus. Jesus was a rabbi who had a large following of people who followed him and Jesus would supply for their needs. And on the night that Judas betrayed Jesus, when he ran out, the other disciples thought, oh, I wonder if he's going to give a gift to the poor. Apparently that was something that Jesus did often. You do not provide for the needs of 12 men, 70 men, hundreds of men, and give gifts to the poor without having a lot of resource and a lot of money. God has no problem with you enjoying life. God has no problem if you want to drive a car that doesn't break down every 10 miles. God has no problem with you wanting to have a home that each one of your kids can have their own room. God doesn't have a problem with you wanting to have a pool in your backyard. He has no problem with you wanting to have something beautiful to wear to church. God is not hung up on those material, natural things. The Bible says that mammon money is the least. It's the lowest. It's the basest. This is something that we use. It's not something that we're used by. Let's read on and take a look at the purpose of it then. We know that we're to enjoy it, right? But verse 18, it says this, tell them to use their money to do good. In other words, here's the purpose of your wealth, rich people. You are to use your money to do good. What does that mean? They should be rich. Once again, he's doing a play on words. You're rich, so be rich in good works and generous to those in need. Always being ready to share with others. He says, you're blessed, why? To be a blessing. You're blessed, why? So that when there's a need, you can provide. You're blessed, why? So that when there's a good work that's to be done, something that's going on, God says that you will have the resource and the ability to share and to do good for others. That is the purpose of wealth. Verse number 19, by doing this, they'll be storing up their treasure 
as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience, look at this, true life. He just said God gives us richly all things to enjoy, but that enjoyment compared to the true life is nothing. The cars, the houses, all that kind of stuff that we mentioned, even a swimming pool, all that kind of stuff. You can enjoy that, but that's not the real life. The real life is the kingdom life. The real life is that when you start to give and when you start to share and when God is blessing your efforts and your labors and your good works and the the generosity that's going out, you start to experience the true life of the kingdom of God and that's the purpose of your wealth. Notice that God has a purpose for the gifts that he gives us. The purpose of the Sabbath is our rest. The purpose of wealth is for generosity and good works. Let me ask you this question today. What are the gifts that God's given you? You ever thought about that? Why am I so good at computers? Why am I so good at art? Why am I so good at singing? Why am I so good at this instrument that I've played since my youth? Why am I so good uh, just, you know, talking to people and relating with people? Why, why have I been given this gift of teaching? Why, have I, why, why am I such a prayer warrior? You know what, I'm up all the time praying for people. What has God given this gift to me for? Do you know that God has a purpose for those things in your life? God made you individually. He informed you, the Bible says, in your mother's womb. Not just the physical characteristics, but the mental and the spiritual characteristics. You look like God, and God made you the way that you are on purpose. God has a place for you in his body. He has a life for you to live. He's got something for you to give. He's got an assignment for you to get going on. And God is saying, I gave you those gifts for a purpose. Which brings us to the last thing is this, is that Jesus has the final say. I feel like I'm repeating myself in this series, but we need to understand that Jesus is no ordinary man. Again, here, Jesus claims to be God by saying that he's Lord of the Sabbath. In one statement, Jesus merges his humanity with his deity. And remember that Jesus never sinned. He never violated the righteous requirement of the law. He fulfilled it, and he lived the perfect, spotless, sinless life. Therefore, he now has the ability and the authority to tell us how we're to live life, and whatever he says goes. God can even supersede the laws that he created on the earth. Is that right? Laws like gravity. Laws like evaporation. Laws like direction and propulsion. God can even break those laws. Why? Because he's God. That's why the Red Sea parted. That's why the Jordan River opened up and the waters piled up while the children of Israel crossed. That's why Joshua could say, sun stand still until we take vengeance on our enemies. And the sun stood still and stayed there while they fought the battle. That's why when Hezekiah was able to go up the steps of the house of the Lord, the shadow turned around and went the other direction. Why? Because God said so. And God does whatever he wants to do. In the same way here, Jesus is saying something, that, that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, listen, I'm God. If I want to make a provision for man's need above the regulation, I can do that. Why? Because he's God. We'd say that. We'd say he could do that. He's God. But now, here, this doesn't make any allowance for sin. Don't, don't, get, don't get off on this. You know, God is not excusing anyone's sin. Nor would God ever himself sin. He cannot sin. The Bible says he dwells in unapproachable light. And in him there is no darkness. There's no variation. No shadow of turning with him. And God cannot lie. Therefore, God doesn't show up and say, well, it's okay to lie. It's okay to cheat because I'm God. You can do that. No. God never, never does that. God will never break his moral law. But when it comes to things like the programs, the policies, the procedures. God is saying that ritual, that religious regulation, guess what? I'm outside of that. That stuff doesn't matter. It's human need that we're going after. And Jesus has the final say. In the book of Job, you remember Job, he didn't sin. He didn't know what he did. And the Bible says that he never said anything about God that was wrong. In all of his speaking, he didn't understand it. And he said, I'd love to connect with God. I'd love, I wish I had an umpire, somebody who was a go-between. And he makes this statement in Job 23, verse number 13, the New Living Translation. He says this, but once he has made his decision, who can change his mind? Whatever he wants to do, he does. Why? 
because he's God. Psalm 115 verse 3, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. That means that no matter what you think of your life, what others have said, no matter what diagnosis you have, what depressing predictions of man, that God can and will show up and do what is pleasing to him. Again, let me bring this home to where you live. Some of you guys have believed the word of man. You're stupid. You're ugly. You'll never amount to anything. You can't do it. It's been too long. You've gone too far. You've done too much. You haven't done enough. It's over. It's dead. It's in the grave. Just let it go. And you've listened to those words and you have stopped. And yet, God has a different report. Some of you guys have gotten the doctor's report. There's only six months to live and that's it. You'll deal with this all your life. This will never change. It will never go away from you. And you've received that and you've accepted that. And yet God says, wait a second. I'm the one who goes outside of the laws of this land, outside of the laws of the, the natural, outside of, of gravity and your body and age and time and space. If it's dead, I'll raise it to life. If it's broken, I'll heal it. If it's hurting, then I'll mend it. If you think that they're gone and they've stopped, then guess what? God is a God who causes the sun to rise every morning and sets it to bed every night. God is the one who spoke and planets exist. God is the God who can speak over your life, who declares your destiny, who will speak over you in every situation to where what God says goes. He's a God who declares the end from the beginning. He's the God who speaks those things that be not as if they were. Our God is the faithful God, the true God. The one living God. He's the only one who can. And don't look to man. Don't look to the predictions. Oh, the market. Oh, the the finances. It's going to be bad. No, 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 no. My God says that Isaac sowed in a time of famine and he reaped a hundredfold. I'm going to be just fine. Start to declare the word of God over your life. Watch as God brings it to pass. Why? Because God has the final. Say, let God be God. I love what the Bible says. Let God be true and every man a liar. I don't want to listen to what man has to say. It's okay to know what you're up against, but don't listen to man. Listen to God. Don't miss the truth of his word. Let his gifts in your life be revealed in the purpose and the passion that he has from his heart, from his character, from his nature, from his attributes. And remember that Jesus always has the final say. Can we listen to his voice together? No one getting up, no one leaving. There's time. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful as we come into this place, as we enter into your presence, Lord. God, we would ask that you would speak to your people. Lord, we don't want to miss what you're saying to us in this moment. Beyond a sermon, beyond a scripture, God, we want to connect with you intimately and personally. Today, as we pray, would you just ask God this question in prayer and just say, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? And then listen for his voice. What's God speaking to you? Maybe today God is revealing to you his character. Maybe that God would say to some of you in this place, I love you. You haven't heard that from anybody today. Yet God wants you to know, I love you. What's God speaking to you? Maybe today God's showing you the purpose of the gift that he gave you. And it sat dormant long enough. He's saying, I want you to share this with others. I want you to do good with it.
What's God speaking to you? Today, I believe that Jesus is declaring things over your life. Remember that he has the final say. I believe that Jesus would say this over you. It's going to be okay. And as you leave this place, remember to rise, take up your mat, and walk. Carry that rest with you. And any time the pressure and the care tries to come on you again, you feel like lying down. No, no, no. Carry the rest. And remind yourself, no, no. It's going to be okay. God said it. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. And if he says it's going to be okay, I'm not going to carry the worry. I'm going to rest. I'm going to rest in his word. It's going to be okay. If you haven't already written it down, write it down. Make a note. If you want to share with a faith-filled friend that's next to you, maybe your spouse, a family member, someone that you trust, you're welcome to share. Even online, if you're in a group of people, you're welcome to share with the group that you're with if you trust them. Or if it's appropriate and you want to post it in the comments section, you can write that right now. Love it when people post scriptures and things that God spoke to them. Let's pray once again. Father, we thank you. God, we're so grateful for your word. Lord, may we not miss the point when we read your word, when we go to church. God, when we see a beautiful sunset, when we see what you're doing in people's lives, God, we don't want to miss out on what you're doing. Father, show us the purpose of the things that you placed in our lives because it's all for your kingdom. It's all for your glory, God. May we do the good works that you've prepared for us and share with the people around us. And Father, we declare that you have the final say. Whatever you say goes, God, because you are Lord of all. We rest in you. In Jesus' name, everybody in agreement said, amen. Amen. One more time, I'm going to ask no one get up low and leave during this time. Unless you're in the leave early sections, you guys are welcome to be dismissed. Get to your ministries. But everybody else, I want you to stay put and listen up. It would be a tragedy if we stopped there. We said, all right, we'll see you next week. And you went out of this place and you died and you ended up in hell and you didn't go to heaven. I don't want that for you. You don't want that for you. But more than both of us, God doesn't want that for you. And I, I guess I have to define leave early sections as those chairs in front of the family room. And so in the future, those of you that are leaving right now, if you need to get out early for work or something like that, you, you need to sit there and not where you're disturbing everybody. So everybody else remains seated during this time, okay? It's not the middle of the sanctuary. Let me get out of here. So sit down, okay? God's speaking to people right now. Don't let anything distract you. Even online, don't let yourself be distracted. Because it'd be a tragedy if you left this place and you died. You went to hell. Hell's a real place. Sometimes people say, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Listen, it doesn't make it go away. It's like going on, standing on a slow lane in the freeway saying, I don't believe in Mack trucks. You're going to meet one face to face sooner or later. Same way you can't just say, well, hell's not real and it goes away. No, it's an eternal reality that we all have to face. Hell is a real place, but heaven is also a real place. And I don't want you to go to hell. You don't want you to go to hell. But more than both of us, God doesn't want you to go to hell. That's why he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. Was so that we didn't have to die and go to hell, but we could be with him forever and ever in heaven. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. You just do your thing. I'll do my thing. The church is out there. They got their way. We'll all make it there somehow, some way. It's all good. No, it's not. See, it's God's heaven, and we have to get there God's way. And not all roads lead to heaven, contrary to what popular culture would have us to believe. You can't get there your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way got to get there God's way. God outlines it for us in his word how to do that. You say, oh, okay, I get it. Well, pastor, it's okay because I've been a good person. Yeah, I used to be bad, but I cleaned up my act. Been really good lately, giving money to charities. Been nice to my neighbors, kind to my family members, even when they've been ugly to me. I got involved in social justice causes for that reason. I wanted to be better. I wanted to be good. And I know that God sees that and appreciates that. In fact, I think I tip the scales. My, my, my good finally outweighs my bad. I had one guy tell me, Pastor, I'm working on my resume. You know, God's not waiting to see your resume. Hmm. Let's see what good days they've done and see whether or not they can get into heaven. 
There's no cosmic scale. God weighs you. God doesn't line you up and whoever's good, you know, oh, well, you're bad, you go to hell. You're good, you go to No, it doesn't work like that. You're going to stand alone before God and give an account of your life, what you've done in the body, whether good or whether evil. And the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it to heaven based on your goodness because your goodness compared to God's goodness, the Bible says it's like filthy rags, not going to get to stay, going to get thrown out. Not going to make it to heaven based on your goodness. No one is perfect except one. His name is Jesus. Oh, but pastor, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Maybe they hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. You went to religious classes like Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class. You've always considered yourself to be a Christian. Born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, or Hindus, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that your upbringing, your family association, your location on the earth, the jewelry you wear, the classes you take, the religious rituals you're involved in, none of that will get you into heaven. God's not sitting there scratching his head wondering what you are because you're not some other religion. Oh, I guess they're Christians. They get to go to heaven. There's no default setting. Okay, pastor, but it wasn't just a childish thing for me. Here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. Here I am watching online right now. And I believe that I'm a Christian. Well, what if I said, you know what? I really like cars. I'm going to go to my house, sit in my garage, call myself a car. Does that make me a car? No. If I log on to a website for cars, does that make me a car? No. I could watch a live stream of Mecca Motto auctions. I'll never become a car. Same way, you can't just sit in church, watch one online. Call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian. Okay, pastor, I, I get what you're saying, but you know, my last church I got involved. I didn't just sit. I helped out. I sang in the choir, carried the pastor Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader, even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. Well, those are all wonderful things. You know that none of them will get you to heaven. God's not looking for your volunteer hour sheet. He's not looking for a membership card to a church like some bank commercial saying, what's in your wallet? And then you get to enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Today, can I love you enough, respect you enough, and tell you the truth, not play games? You're not going to make it. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I know God. You don't have to bug me about this. It's fine. There were people, they were bugging people. They were witnessing and evangelizing. They said, do you know God? I said, yeah, I know God. He said, oh, but do you know Jesus? I said, yes, I know Jesus. They said, oh, we're so sorry. We won't bug you anymore. We'll, we'll go talk to someone else who actually needs Jesus. You know who he is. You're fine. I'm fine, Pastor. Leave me alone. I know about Easter. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. Old New Testament. John 3, 16. And while that's great, if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you've missed the point of the scriptures. Because just in knowing the scriptures doesn't get you into heaven. Just in knowing who God is doesn't get you into heaven. How do I know that? Because in the scriptures, it says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and they tremble. Why? Because they know they're not going to make it to heaven. The devil himself knows God. Been in his presence. Talk to him. You find that in Job chapter number one. He makes war with God. He knows who God is. You'll find the devil quoting scriptures in the gospel. He's not a Christian. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Even online, look at your screen right now. This is not about what you have up here in your head. Not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is. Not about what you've done out here with your hands, but rather, are you still watching? It's about what you've done right here in your heart. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Some of you just turned off right now. Well, oh, born again, gosh, I hate that. That's weird, that's goofy. You know, the blog said it wasn't scriptural. That's pretty stupid because it's in John chapter 3. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1. It's all throughout the Bible, the concept. You can't get there any other way except God's way. It's not a way, it's the way. You must. It's not an option. You must. You must be born again. Oh, but this celebrity, they got saved, and they're one of those born-again Christians. They're weird. They're goofy. I don't want to be weird or goofy. Listen, you don't have to be weird or goofy. But if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. So does that mean what Hollywood, movies, television, books, and blogs on the internet say? Or does it mean what the Bible has to say? I submit to your thinking today, it means what the Bible has to say, because this is the authority right here. Boy, you don't want to miss the point. What is God saying about being born again? What does that really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible, 
to the end of the Bible, being born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. <laughs> Gross, Jesus. Pretty graphic, wouldn't you say? But what is he saying? He's saying lukewarm, half-hearted Christianity is not real Christianity at all. You cannot remain a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. Having an occasional church attendance, God being something in your life and not everything, and think that you're going to get to go to heaven. You will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ if that's the condition of your heart. And today is your day of salvation. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. When I say three, I'm going to pop my hand on this microphone. Bang, just like that. And when you hear the sound of my hand popping that microphone, bang, that's your opportunity to simply raise your hand. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're making a statement. You're saying something. You're saying, hey, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. If you're here live, I'll count it. You can put it right back down online. You can just throw that hand up for a moment and then put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Why do we got to raise hands, Pastor? If I raise my hand in this place, a lot of people around me right now, they'll see me and I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. That's okay. Think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade, by the way. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. Yet the devil thinks you're a fool. He's trying to talk you out of this right now. Tell the devil to go to hell. I didn't just cuss. That's a real place. You're not going with him. You're going on with God today. Get ready to get your hands up. Jesus said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see it go up. Put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. Everybody's excited for you around you. We've all done it at one point or another. We're all ex somethings in this place. You're in good company. We were all messed up, tore up from the floor up. And yet God picked us up, set our feet upon the rock, cleaned us up, and gave us a future. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Or will you sit there and do nothing? But know this, that Jesus said, if you reject me, or if you're ashamed of me, he says, I will reject and be ashamed of you. Today, your call. Today, your choice. You can sit there and do nothing. How about this? Make the right choice. Give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life. Pastor, I prayed a prayer at one time. Is that enough? Listen, God's not looking for magical abracadabra words. Did you follow up the prayer with all of your heart and all of your life? Because if not, you're not going to make it. There's no fire insurance. He doesn't just throw up a prayer one time. And God says, oh, they made the magical abracadabra prayer, and now they get to be a Christian. God's no fool. He sees your life. He's looking at your heart. And he knows, and you know. Today, you need to get right with God. Pastor, what if I mess it up? I'm such a screw-up. I made so many mistakes in my life, and what if I commit, and then I mess it up afterwards? Then, hey, then you get up, you dust off, and then you keep following God. That's what repentance is. You turn from your way, and you keep going God's way. You don't give up. God said all of your heart and all of your life, and you keep following God. Pastor, will it make my problems go away? I've got a lot of problems. Will this deal with my problems? No, this deals with your salvation. And then after you're saved, you've got God on your side to help you deal with the problems. But you need to give God all of your heart, and you need to give God all of your life despite your problems. Who should raise your hand in this place? If you've been running from God instead of two, God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Make sure today. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm, half-hearted, maybe you're backslidden, come on, today you can come home like the prodigal. I'm going to count to three, pop my hand on this microphone. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up on the count of three, live and online. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. If that's you, thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. There's three over there. God bless you. Who else today? Three wise people. Who else up on top? There's four. I got you right there. Thank you. God bless you. Four wise people already. There's five and six, all right? You guys doing that on your own or no one's making anybody, right? It's got to be your own thing, all right? So five and six, wonderful, wonderful. Just want to make sure it's number seven right there. You say, Pastor, why do you say that? Because a woman nudges her husband and says, you don't get right, I'm leaving you, right? And he's like, <laughs> God knows your heart. All right, seven, eight, nine. Thank you, God bless you. Who else today? You know you need to give God all of your heart, and you know you need to give God all of your life. You know, in the first service, we had a whole bunch of stubborn people. They just were like, mm. 
I'm not giving God my heart. And I called them out on it. And they realized, you know, it's time to do this. Maybe you're one of those stubborn, stiff-necked people, and you're just like, hmm. But the Bible says if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, He will lift you up. And God's saying, don't just sit there and do nothing. Well, I already prayed a prayer. I already been to church. I already heard that verse. God is saying, will you stop it? Don't be stubborn. Come on, humble yourself before me. If you'll surrender, man, God will lift you up. God will lift you up. Don't let anything hold you back, not even yourself right now. If that's you, come on, raise your hand. He said, Pastor, if I raise my hand now, they'll know I'm stubborn. Well, pff, humble yourself, come on. It's okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? You know you need to get right with God. Anybody else? I just want to give you one more moment. If you're sitting there, your heart's beating out of your chest, you broke out in a sweat and you wish I'd shut up, I think God's speaking to you. I just want to give you one more moment. About eight or nine wise people, anybody else in this place today? Anybody else? Any stubborn people willing to humble themselves and admit, I need God. All right, there's one more up there. I don't know how stubborn they are, but praise God for you. Wonderful. Nine. Number 10, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Let's go for God. Last call. We're going to wrap this up and pray. Anybody else? Come on, number 10. God's just tugging at your heart right now. Anybody else? Where are we at? Oh, right there. Wonderful. Got you, number 10. Number 11 right there. I think there's one more. One more right there. Number 12. Praise God for that. Can we give the Lord a great big praise for 12 wise people? Amen. Amen. Good call. Good call. All 12 of you, number 13, 14, 15, and 16, number 17 and 18, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend, if you need a friend, once you get in now, meet me up front. In the foyer, in the family rooms, out there in the courtyard, I got speakers all the way down the breezeways. If you know you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life, and you were headed out, I want you to make an about face and come back into the sanctuary right now. Come on, let's all stand. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me up front right here. Come on down. Let's welcome them. They're coming right now. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. All 12 of you and the other six, you need to come. Come on down. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Come on. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Just come on down to the front right now. Come on. We'll wait for you. Come on down. Come on down. There's room for you here at the altar. No one leave. Let them come. Let them come. was born with. They're still coming. Let's give my hand as they come. You can come too. Come to the altar, the I believe there's two more that you need to come right now. Come on down. When my forgiveness was born with Anybody else? Come on. Come on down. Jesus Christ will come to the altar. Hey, you guys came. This is the best decision of your entire life right here, right now. About ready to give God all of your heart. About ready to give God all of your life. God's going to come in and do a miracle. Make you brand new. It's amazing. The past is gone. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, and that's for men and women, by the way. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old things have passed away. and The, the sins and the mess-ups and the mistakes and all those things are gone. You get a brand new start with a brand new heart today. You get a clean slate. God wants to write his story right here on your heart. It's going to take a commitment. That means consistency. We have eight church services a week here. We're working hard for you to get into church. I want to encourage you, stay consistent. Keep coming to church. In fact, give God this next year and just plant here at the rock. Keep coming consistently. Get two, three. If you're radical, get like four services a week. That's just half, all right? You can do that, right? But get as much as you can is what I'm saying. And as you plug into the things of God, watch this next year. Next July, you'll be like, wow, look at what God has done in my life. With those thoughts in mind, let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Everybody's going to join in together. Even online, if you raise your hand, you're giving your heart to the Lord. Pray this along with us right now. Say, Father God, I come to you today in Jesus' name. And I give you 
all of my heart and all my life. Please come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my past. Make me new and give me a future with you. For I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came, He died, and was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and lead me for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, guys, welcome to the family. Love you guys so much. and so excited for your new life in Jesus Christ. Now, listen. I didn't grow in the things of God until I had a friend come teach me some things out of the Bible, help me to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So I want to give you that same opportunity. I want to give you a friend. The first one I want to give you is my friend, Pastor Joel, waving at you. He wants to give you some free information, talk to you about getting back into church, and introduce you to some really cool people that can answer some questions for you, meet with you before church. So talk about how that works. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. Take a couple minutes of your time. Just make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Church, I want to invite you guys back tonight. We talk about having eight services. We're here working hard for you tonight. They've got different music set, different message. You're going to grow in the things of God. And then right afterwards, we've got some fun out there in the courtyard to connect. You need some godly friends. And if you don't have faith-filled people in your life, tonight, 6 o'clock, come to church. And then right afterwards, go meet some friends and connect with the family of God here at The Rock. Love you guys. One, also, another reminder, I want to see you in Bible college. So head on out to the table right afterwards. Get the information. Pray and listen to what God has for you. Can I bless you as you go? Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Father, I bless the saints of God from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. They are blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going. May everything they put their hands to, they shall prosper. And Lord, with a great big shout of faith about our area, we declare that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Hey there, thank you so much for joining us online. What a blast getting to do church with all of you. If you just gave your heart to Jesus and prayed the salvation prayer with our pastor, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Here at The Rock, we wanna get you plugged in and set up for success with your new walk with God. Now in a moment, I'd like you to head to our Respond to God page so you can fill out some information and we can get in touch with you. We not only wanna give you some free material, but we'd also like to get you hooked up with a friend who can help guide you through your new relationship with God. We have multiple friends available for you in any kind of interaction you'd like, whether that be a Zoom chat, a phone call, email, or any type of COVID-friendly interaction. We've got friends just for you. We have this great little booklet called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. If you live within the continental United States, we'd love to get this paper copy in your hands. If you don't live here, don't even worry about it. We've got an electronic copy in PDF format we'd love to get to you as well. We also have this fun little comic book for your kids out there. If any of those kids just gave their heart to Jesus, this comic book is for you. Now it helps explain their new walk with God in a fun sort of age-friendly way that they can understand. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is go ahead and click on that link provided. And if you can't find a link, don't worry about it. We'll take you to our webpage. Just go to rockchurch.com and click on the Respond to God tab at the bottom right-hand corner. This is gonna take you to a new page where we can get all of your information so we can send you either one of these free copies and we can get you hooked up with a friend who will help walk you through these next steps. Well, it has been wonderful hearing the word of God with you today. We can't wait to see you at our next service. And remember, God loves you and so do we.